So despite today's weather, uh, we are beginning to see the signs of the end of winter, which is really exciting for me. I'm not a fan of winter in any way. <laughs> the days are getting a little bit longer, and this is especially noticeable in the evenings because uh, if the sky is clear, sometimes there's still light until 6.30 or later. And while the weather is still cold, we're not getting that really frigid sub-zero temperatures that we were feeling in January. And all of those are good signs, and there's hope that sooner or later we're going to be able to go outside again. We don't have to put on 12 layers of clothes, and then uh, if we, we still feel like we're going to turn into an icicle. However, there is something else that comes with the end of winter, which I'm sure most of you have experienced if you've been in and around the city the last couple of weeks. They're something that make this time of year frightening and sometimes even dangerous. They turn an ordinary trip to the store into an adventure that might lead to a flat tire, a messed up alignment, or a bent rim, or even worse. Of course, what I'm talking about are the potholes. They seem to be all over the streets, and in my, in my job, my other uh, work that I do, I have to do a lot of driving around the city, and so I tell you, it is amazing. I mean, they're, it's, it's, they're everywhere, and they're big, and they're really, really, really um, just, uh, they, they will su suck up your whole car. And what's more is they're very deceptive, because they might seem, as you're driving and approaching, they might see the, seem like you can drive right over them, and then you find out that they're much bigger than except, expected, and your whole tire is swallowed up. And what we see now as we're starting to study the life of David, beginning with the stories of those who preceded him in Israel's history, Samuel and next week Saul, we find that life is often like a pothole-filled road. You think you're going along really smooth, and then something hits you, and then it, it, it just swallows you up. And so we're going to be looking at some of the potholes that, that certain people in the Bible encountered, particularly in the story of Samuel that we study today. Oh, one other thing I did want to point out in the hymn that was this morning, because I don't have it actually in the notes, I did want to mention uh, you, the line in, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, you heard, you heard the line that says, Now I raise my Ebenezer. People say, what in the world is that? Where is that? What's that about? Well, actually, that comes from this story. I don't particularly bring it out, but I did want to point it out since we sang it this morning. This verse in 1 Samuel 7, 11 through 12, and this is where uh, after Samuel becomes the judge of Israel and starts to lead the, uh, lead the people along, that uh, they had victory over the Philistines, and they built a stone, and the stone... Uh, is called the stone of Ebenezer, or which means a stone of help. So when the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, drove them back as far as beth -car. then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So when, when this hymn writer said, uh, Now I raise my Ebenezer, <clears throat> it's talking about the memorial of this stone, that, that God is our help. So although the mo main focus of our current ser sermon series is on Israel's second king, David, <clears throat> to fully understand David's life, we need to look at some of the personalities that were very important, that had very important roles in setting the stage for David's eventual rule over God's people Israel. The books of First and Second Samuel were originally just, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, were just one book. Uh, in the early Hebrew Bible. The books clearly, though, were not written by Samuel themselves because in chapter 25 of 1 Samuel, we, we read of his death. So there are five more chapters of 1 Samuel and all of 2 Samuel that are written about the events that take place after he died. So he was not the author. Uh, the reason that the books have his name is not because he wrote them, but because he's really central to all of the events that take place, even after his death. He was the one that, in many ways, set the stage for the rule of Saul and the rule of David. And so these, these two books of the Bible carry his name, even though he is not the author. There are four primary characters in 1 Samuel. And the stories of each one flows into that of the next. And each one has an important influence on the life of the next person in, that, in, in the stories. The four people that we find, the four people that are focused on in the book of first, books of First and Second Samuel, are Eli, Samuel, Saul, and of course David. 
And Samuel is the one who lived during the times of all of the other three. He was, he was alive during the time of Eli, and then his life continued through, throughout the life and the reign of Saul, and into early into the, the uh, life of David as well. So you saw this chart last week. Just to give you some perspective again as to what we're looking at, this, this uh, took place. The, uh, Samuel lived to be about 90 years old. He was born around 1102 A.D., and then lived until around 1014. And his lifespan allowed him to know and to interact with Eli, Saul, and David. And so what we're going to see from this brief overview is that he had a very remarkable life and, and it influenced many of these important personalities. So the story begins when we are introduced with, to Hannah, Samuel's mother. She was a devout, godly woman who had no children. She was one of two wives of a man named Elkanah. Now, the cultural values of the time put great importance on a woman being able to bear children. And because Elkanah's other wife already had children, this was especially painful for Hannah, that she was barren, that she did not have any children. So during the time that we're looking at, around 1100 BC, the tabernacle of God, where the Ark of the Covenant was, was in the central part of the land of Israel in a place called Shiloh. And we know, obviously, later on in Israel's history, it gets located permanently to the temple that is built in Jerusalem. But at this point, it was, there was still residing in the tabernacle, which was a tent, essentially, that was mobile, and it was located in this city of Shiloh, which is pretty centrally located uh, from the north and the south, east and the west of the land of Israel. So Elkanah, who was the husband of Hannah, went up to offer sacrifices, as was required of the Jews, at least three times a year. Hannah also went to Shiloh with her husband to worship the Lord, and it was there in great sorrow that she made a vow to the Lord that if he would give her a son, that she would dedicate this child to the service of God. God granted Hannah's request, and she had a son, and then she in turn was faithful to her word. After she had weaned the boy, she brought him back to Shiloh and turned him over to the care of Eli, the priest. Eli then trained Samuel well in the ministry that he was supposed to do as that of a priest. In fact, he seems to have given more attention to Samuel. Eli seems to have given more attention to Samuel than he did to his own sons, as we're going to see a little bit later on. Now, Hannah's dedication of Samuel to the Lord is for many the pattern of the practice in many Bible-believing churches of ceremonies of child dedication. When Hannah turned, turned uh, her son Samuel over to, to God, dedicated him to, to the Lord, that uh, we have this practice in, in our churches of dedicating a child. Now, I don't really know the full history of how and why evangelical and fundamentalist churches started doing child dedications. I suspect at least I know from our time in the Philippines, which I'll be talking a little bit about, it really be, what came about as a replacement for the practice of infant baptism. Um, and as long as I've actually been the pastor of the ch this church, I've never been asked to do a child dedication. We've had a number of babies that have been born here, and, it, and I've just never been requested to actually perform a, a dedication ceremony. Not that I have anything against it. I think it's a good idea. But likewise, I don't pressure people into it. I, it's, it's not a biblical ceremony. I think there's value, and, and it's worthwhile just in terms of what it represents, but uh, I've never pressured people, no one has ever requested, so we've never, as long as I've been the pastor, we've never had a child dedication. Now, when we were in the Philippines, though, that was a very common event. One reason was there were just so many babies born. They have an amazing population growth there, and so uh, there were always babies being born, and, there were, and, and this child dedication ceremony was very important. And uh, there, there's, it had a lot, they placed a lot of cultural significance on this, on the dedication. Since the Philippines is predominantly a Roman Catholic country, the baptism of babies is very important. And it was typical for then the parents to request a host of people to be the godparents for the child. You didn't just ask one couple, you might have ten people up here that were sponsoring the child, as they would say, or being, uh, the Filipino word was to be the maninong or maninang. And uh, that was, 
then you were taking on a, in a, a culturally, you were taking on a role that you were going to be uh, committed to the family and to the child for the rest of his life. And if possible, they would try to get prominent people in the community to take on that role. And so this was a way that they could broaden their social network since the godparent of the child came with certain lifetime obligations to assist the child and the family. Now, as families came to Christ, came to, to an understanding of the scriptural understanding of, of, of the word of God, uh, they understood that infant baptism was not a biblical practice. And so they, yet they did not want to give up the, the important social practice of this dedication or this, or this event when the child was young. So they embraced the practice, the, the evangelical believers in the Philippines embraced the practice of the child dedication ceremony in which the parents would pledge to raise their child in the ways of the Lord and to bring them to church, teach them the gospel early, and to allow God to use the child for his honor and glory. Now, in any culture, anywhere, the birth of a child is a huge event in the life of a new family. It's always accompanied with a host of emotions. Anytime that, that a new baby comes into a family's life, there's joy and excitement, anticipation and hope associated with new births. Likewise, there is this incredible sense of fear and responsibility with the idea of being responsible for the training and the nurture of a human life with all the potential that that little person holds for both good and evil. And therefore, it's natural for people to want to have a formal commitment and statement in public that they wish to seek God's help and the guidance and the support of the congregation to raise the children according to biblical principles and to teach them that to love God and with all of their heart and all of their soul and all of their mind. And so the, the dedication, while it's not a biblical practice per se, I think it's a valuable thing to do. I think it's worthwhile. And again, it represents uh, a formal statement that you want to raise this child according to the principles of God. Now, in Hannah's case, her dedication of Samuel was far more than anything we do in a modern child dedication service. She was literally giving up this small child who was no, lo no older than two or three years at the time and physically leaving him alone with people that she hardly knew. This was not a requirement that God placed on people in, for Israel in the Old Testament. This was something, this was a decision that she made willingly to let go of something that she had longed for for most of her life and to turn it over to God. We read that she was given five more children, but of course the other children don't replace the one that she lost. Uh, I remember many years ago I had a conversation with a young father who had lost a baby to sudden infant death syndrome. And he said how frustrating it was when people would say to him and his wife, well, you're young and you can have more kids. He said to me, kids are not like a coffee pot that if one is broke, you just go to Walmart and get another. You don't replace an old one with a new one. And that, that loss was unique and irreplaceable. So when Hannah gave up Samuel to the Lord for a lifetime of service, that was a great sacrifice. The pain was somewhat mitigated by having other children, but she would never be able to fully, uh, she would never be able to in, entirely erase that sense of loss and sadness that she had by giving up her first firstborn son. When I was much younger, I had graduated from college in Wisconsin and I went on a short-term mission trip to the Philippines. It was supposed to be about six weeks that I was going to be gone, and it, and it turned out to be nine months. And during that time, the Lord was working on my heart. Now, I, I went there. I had no anticipation or plan at that point to go into the ministry, certainly not to be a missionary. I was really kind of going almost with just a sense of adventure when I went for the, what was going to be the six-week trip that turned into nine months. But it was during that time that the Lord got a hold of my heart and started to put a burden on my heart to go into ministry, to commit my life to full-time ministry. I was writing back to my mother about how I felt the Lord was moving me and leading me, well, that did not sit too well with her. She had the same hopes that most American Christian mothers have for their kids, that the child would accept Jesus Christ as Savior at a very young age, go to church and youth group and do the right things as a teenager, go to college and get trained to get a good job, get married, join a church, preferably the, preferably the same one that she belonged to, maybe become a Sunday school teacher or an elder, and then give her grandchildren. 
The idea of going into full-time ministry, and especially going overseas as a missionary, was not part of her plan. However, I remember while I was in the Philippines during that time, receiving a letter from her during that nine-month stint, in which she basically said that she had come to terms with what God was doing in my heart, and that she remembered the promise that she and my father made when they had the child dedication for myself, and the promise that that included letting the Lord use me in any way that, that he felt fit, and that, in fact, she had to be willing to turn over me, her youngest son, I was the youngest son, the last one, the caboose, as she used to call me, uh, the youngest of six, and she said that, that she really came to terms that, that if God was going to use me in this way, that she had to honor the, the promise that she made during the dedication ceremony. Now, Hannah recognized the Lord's authority, and in the song of praise that she sang after she brought the young Samuel and left her, she, she says, the Lord, he says, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he set the world upon them. He recognized that this child that she had really was the Lord's. It was his gift to her. She was only, in a sense, a steward of it, and she was willing to turn that child over. And God has given us so much through his grace, and he desires that we should be willing to return the blessings of this world over to him so that we can bring him glory. Now then we go on to read in the story in 1 Samuel chapter 2, 18 through 20, that Hannah would visit Samuel each year, and she made a little robe for him. That's, you can picture the, the cute little priest's robe that, the, that he was wearing as a little child, probably two or three years old, running around the temple or the tabernacle like that in this, this little robe. And every year she would make a new robe for him and bring it back to him while he was a child. And he was learning to serve the Lord in the tabernacle. However, even as a child, God had a very important role for this young boy. Now, Eli, as we said, was the priest that oversaw the sacrifices in the tabernacle. And he had two sons, which, according to 1 Samuel 2, 12, were corrupt. And depending on the translation that you have, the NIV says that they were scoundrels. And the Holman translation says that they were wicked men. And some will say that they were corrupt or depraved. Uh, all different translations. The idea was that they were, they were really just completely outside of the will of God in the things they did. They would steal the food that was being offered for the sacrifices. But even worse, we read in 1 Samuel 2.21, that they took sexual advantage of the women who served as helpers at the doors of the tabernacle. Now, the behavior that we see in the sons of Eli speaks directly to our own times. When we think of all that's in the news right now with the allegations of sexual harassment by men who are in positions of power and influence, we see that they did the exact same thing, that there was nothing new about that kind of behavior. And while this kind of abuse of power is inexcusable in any profession or in any way of life, it is particularly despicable when it is perpetrated by someone claiming to be a servant of God. When a man takes advantage of a woman for his own selfish pleasure and uses his role as a minister to try to get her to be attracted to him, that is a special kind of reprehensible. Men in ministry often deal with people at moments of their greatest emotional vulnerability. They are called to deal with people who are grieving, who are experiencing familial problems, financial crisis, a whole host of situations where the people would find themselves in particular need of emotional support and particularly emotionally weak at that time. And so it is enraging to think of men who would use that role of a spiritual counselor to take advantage of women in such circumstances. And worse yet, those that take advantage of the special access that they might have to children and to youth to abuse the youngest and most vulnerable in the congregation. Eli himself recognized this when he told his sons the following. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I fear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. Excuse me, for I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. You see, he's saying when you, in that position of ministry, when you abuse that authority and that right and that access and that privilege that you have, you are actually then causing the people 
to sin themselves. They're going to look at that. They're going to say, well, if the priest can do it, if the preacher can do it, if this person can do it, well, why can't I? You cause the people to transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. Now, of course, the role of the minister today is not the same as that of the priest of the Old Testament. No one needs another person to intercede for them. That is the role of Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the Father and the Holy Spirit, who takes our prayers and makes intercession according to the will of God. So the priests, of course, had a very special function in the Old Testament as being that intermediary, that intercessor between God and man. But still, the minister today in the body of Christ has a great spiritual influence on believers and plays an important role as a teacher and as an advisor and in a, as an example of godly living. How is someone to fulfill any of those roles if they are walking so dramatically outside of the will of God? Now, I'm not saying that a person who has committed these sinful acts as a minister is beyond redemption, by no means. Restoration is exactly what God's grace is all about. However, when someone commits a grievous sin while in the ministry, they should experience appropriate consequences. If what they did was criminal behavior, they should be punished appropriately by the criminal justice system. If it was not against the law, there should still be an appropriate time of discipline in which the person is not allowed to be involved in formal ministry and therefore um, be able to be restored to a position of ministry after there is clear evidence recognized by a legitimate group of spiritual leaders that there has been true repentance and that the person has established a consistent pattern of godly, sanctified living for at least a year or, or longer. So because of the behavior of the two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and because Eli was complicit in allowing their behavior to continue by giving them priestly responsibilities in the first place, an anonymous man of God prophesied that Eli and his sons would die and no one from their line would serve again as priests in Israel. This then brings us back to the story of Samuel. He is mentioned again in chapter 3 of 1 Samuel, the, the boy Samuel. At this point, he's probably about 12, 10 to 12 years old. And this is one of the most common children's Sunday school stories in the Old Testament. Many of you grew up hearing this by, from your Sunday school teachers. Samuel was still in Shiloh, serving with Eli in the tabernacle. One night, he heard a voice calling. The young Samuel thought that his mentor, Eli, was the one who was calling him. And three times this happened. So he heard this voice calling out to Samuel. He went to Eli. He said, what would you like? Eli said, I, didn't, I wasn't the one who called you. The third time, when Samuel heard the voice, Eli realized that what Samuel was hearing was actually the audible voice of God. And so Eli told him to stay in his bed and to answer that voice and said, uh, speak for your servant hears, to, to, to listen to what that voice was saying. And so that's what Samuel did. The third time, or the fourth time actually, that he heard the voice, he said, speak for your servant hears. Now, those are pretty big words for a 12-year-old boy. Unfortunately, there are plenty of adults who lack the spiritual maturity to listen to the voice of God in the same way Samuel was willing to do. The Lord then told Samuel that, he was going, that, the, that God was going to bring judgment on Eli and his sons. The next morning, Eli asked Samuel what God had told him. And Samuel was afraid to say it. You can imagine, so Eli is this older mentor of Samuel, this older man. Samuel's a 12-year-old boy, and God had given him the word that you are going to die. You and your sons are going to be put to death because of the sinful behavior of your sons and the fact that you allowed that to happen in Israel. And so you can imagine that he would have been very frightened, nervous. Who would want to have to give that news, especially to someone so much older, someone whom he respected? Because from all indication, Eli did a good job of training Samuel. A poor job of training his sons, but he did a good job of, of taking care of Samuel. Samuel, no doubt, had a lot of respect for, for Eli. This is a clear example that God is able to use people at any age to do amazing and important work for him. 
Now, sometimes children, in their sincerity and their innocence, they're able to say things that would be ignored if it was said by an adult. Does anyone remember the show, Art Linkletter show, uh, Kids Say the Darndest Things? You know, they would just blurt anything out because they didn't realize all the implications behind it. And so sometimes children can be effective in ministry. They can really be, they, they can be the ones that will, um, that, that will, will challenge you and that will um, have, to, have to, here's a confession. Uh, just an example of that. I was driving with, and this is, be very careful when you got your grandkids in the back, back of the car. <laughs> so Miles was in the back, and someone did something, you know, cut me off or something like that while I was driving, or I don't know what, what it was. I said, um, I, I said, what a stupid thing to do. And Miles, of course, said, Papa, we do not call people stupid. <laughs> So, so we see that children can be used to, uh, in ministry, they can be used to correct. In this case, Eli was being called in a very big way to, to correct, uh, or I mean Samuel was being used in a very big way to correct Eli. And of course, many of you are already thinking that this is not the last time that we're going to see an example of a young boy being used to uh, take on the responsibility of an adult in this story uh, in, in these uh, series of sermons that we're going to look at. Clearly, not every 12-year-old has the, has the maturity to handle great responsibilities such as D Samuel and David. However, there is value in challenging children to take on responsibility and to give them the opportunity to demonstrate maturity and the ability to tackle problems uh, and to do important work as soon as possible. Now, no one would ever advocate going back to the days before child labor laws when children as young as 10 were sent to work, to work in factories and on farms. But actually, both my father and my father-in-law uh, had to leave school when, in the eighth grade to support their families. They never believed that this was ideal, and it's good that our thinking has changed on this matter. But even as young boys, 13, 14 years old, they were able to take on adult responsibilities. However, by, by the same token, we have created a society in which young people never seem to have to face real responsibility until they are well into their 20s. And we see from the story of Samuel that we probably are underestimating our youth and the responsibility that they are, willing, that they are able to take upon themselves. That here, this young boy of 12 years old had this great role that he had to play to warn Eli of, uh, of this impending judgment that God was going to bring upon him. The story then goes on to tell of how the Israelites lost in battle against their perpetual enemies, the Philistines. Now, the Philistines were a group of people who lived along the Mediterranean coast of Palestine. Many believe that their origins were from seafaring people from the Aegean Sea, from Crete and, and that part of uh, near Greece, that area, who came to the coast of Canaan and they established five city-states that were the center of their civilization. They battled Israel throughout the times of the judges, and they continued to be a threat even until the time of David. In Samuel, 1 Samuel 4, we read of how the Philistines defeated Israel in battle. The Israelites believed that they could be victorious, however, if they took the Ark of the Covenant in the next battle. They took that ark that, that God had made. The ark, of course, was the vessel that contained the tablets upon which God had written the law that he gave to Moses. The presence of the Lord hovered over the ark between the, the cherubim, the angel figures that we see whenever you see a picture of them. So the, 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 the presence of the Lord hovered over the cherubim, and that, that uh, vessel, the ark, was supposed to be kept behind the curtain that separated the holiest of holies in the tabernacle. Now, there was some precedence for what they were doing in that the priests carried the ark with when the Israelites marched around the city of Jericho during the time of Joshua. However, at that time, it was specifically commanded by the Lord that they should do so. This time, it was the elders of Israel who made the decision to take the ark into battle, and they were trusting in its power in more of a superstitious way rather than looking to the Lord himself. They thought that there was some kind of power in the, in the ark itself rather than recognizing that it was the Lord who gave the power. So in Joshua's case, he told them, carry the ark. Maybe it's to symbolize that it was the God of Israel who was going to conquer. Now in this, in this story here in Samuel, 
it was the elders of Israel who said, well, maybe if it worked back then, it's going to work now. And so they decided to take the Ark of the Covenant with them into the next battle that they had against the Philistines. So the Israelites went to battle, and they were soundly defeated. And during that battle, the sons of Eli were killed, and the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. Now, when Eli had learned that learned of this great defeat, especially the fact that the, law, that the ark had been lost and taken capture, captive by the Philistines. It said that he fell backward, backwards in his chair and that he was a big man and it broke his neck and he died. And so and that's, the, that's the end then, of course, of Eli and his sons in the story. But then what we also see is that the, the Philistines misinterpreted their victory. They believed that they had defeated the Israelites because of their superior might and the support of their god, Dagon. In reality, their conquest was the Lord's judgment against Israel for going into battle trusting in an object rather than believing that the Lord himself was the source of their power. And so the, the Philistines learned the fact very, very fast that they, they were not the ones who, who were able to beat, the, um, to beat the Israelites. Now, this should give us warning against trying to interpret events that we see as being caused by God, and in turn, trying to assign God's, the reasons for such events, such as God's blessings or his curse. The, the Philistines thought that they were the ones that, would, that had um, won that battle, when in fact they hadn't. They did not understand what was actually going on behind the scenes. We read about a similar situation in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, in which Jesus healed a man born blind, and the disciples asked Jesus who had sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. And Jesus answered that neither of them had sinned. The man was blind so that, so that the works of God would be demonstrated through him. And we should take that attitude about everything that happens in our life. We should not be trying to guess if God is trying to bless or curse us, but rather say whatever happens to us, it will be a way in which we can glorify God and that, that we can, uh, and through our reaction to the circumstances that we face, we are going to be able to, to recognize that God is glorified through this. As Paul said, he had learned to be content in whatever circumstances he found himself in. And we should face every situation, good or bad, and seek, how, seek out how it is that we are able to bring glory to God through it. As I said, the Philistines learned the truth of the situation soon enough. They put the ark in the temple of their god, Dagon, and then it said that in the morning, the, the idol that was there, the statue of Dagon, fell over on its face. The priest went and sat it back up, put it, put it back up, stood it back up. Uh, and then the next night, the same thing happened, but this time the arms and the head broke off of the, of the idol. Then God struck the Philistines with a horrible affliction. Uh, traditionally, in the old King James Version, uh, it said that they were struck with hemorrhoids. And more recent scholars believe that it was some kind of tumors associated with the bubonic plague. Neither of them sound good, I tell you. I, I wouldn't want either of those. Uh, whatever it was, the reason they associate it with the bubonic plague is because of the rats. If you remember, they make uh, when they, when they, if you read, have read this story, they send, uh, they make golden tumors that they send back to as kind of a, a offering to the Israelites and rats. And because the bubonic plague is associated with rats, a lot of scholars believe that that's what the tumors were from. As I said, either way, I wouldn't want either of them. They recognized then through that experience when they were all inflicted with these tumors that it was the God of Israel that had caused Israel to be defeated, and now he was punishing the Philistines for having this object that belonged to Israel, that was supposed to be in the midst of Israel, in their midst. And so they, they recognized that the God of Israel was displeased and that they had control of this very important symbol. So what they did was they put it on a cart with two, uh, two uh, cows and they sent it off, and the cows walked back to Israel on their own. And God, in a sense, delivered it back to Israel. They didn't want anything to do with it. They wanted to just get, get rid of this thing because of all the trouble that it was causing. Then after the ark returned, Samuel, who was now a grown man, became the last judge of Israel. And as a judge, he was a heroic leader. Samuel was also a priest and a prophet. 
In Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 7, we read of how the people of Israel repented and did what they were supposed to do. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the aster asterisks from among you, and prepare your hearts to the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. And for the rest of Samuel's time, they had success. For this, the rest of the time that Samuel was serving as a judge over Israel, they had relative peace and safety. The Israelites were victorious and lived in relative safety throughout the lifetime of Samuel. We see that the Israelites had it within them, however, to do the right thing. And so much of what we read of their history is, is about their failure. But there were these moments, such as this, when they repented, when they did what was right in God's sight, and they were able to enjoy the peace of God. They were able to enjoy God's blessing and God's protection. And this should be an encouragement that we, too, as members of the body of Christ, should be able to get it right in our relationship with the God, with the Lord as well. It's important for us to remember that there are two aspects of our relationship with God. This is our position and our practice. As members of the body of Christ, we have an unchanging standing before the Lord that is our identity based on the work of Christ. We are saved and sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. We are sanctified, and in God's view, we are seated in heavenly places. We have been crucified with Christ, and our old, old sinful nature was put to death, and we have been raised to newness of life. These are things which do not change. And they give us then the freedom to have peace and the boldness to, boldness to live our lives for the glory of God, recognizing our spiritual position that does not change. We don't lose that, that sanctification, that positional sanctification. We don't lose our salvation. We don't lose any of these things about our relationship with God that are positional. Likewise, Israel had a position. It was as the chosen people of God. Now, collectively, based on the promises that were given to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they could do nothing to nullify their position. And keep in mind that this did not have to do with personal salvation. Personal salvation, in, even in Israel, had to be an individual choice. But nationally, collectively, as a nation, they had a position that did not change. It was based on promise. And so... Collectively, as a people, even in their moments of greatest sin, they were still identified as the people of God. The same is true for members of the body of Christ. If we have put our faith in the gospel, believe that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again, we are members of the body of Christ. We have a position with Christ that does not change. However, when Israel walked outside of the will of God, they had no victory in their battles. They were constantly being defeated because they were not drawing upon the power of God. They were trusting in themselves, such as, or in the ark, or something else. Sometimes they even looked to other gods, if we read their history. However, when they turned and walked in the ways of the Lord, they had victory, and they, had, and they were able to conquer their enemies. Likewise, we today have a similar principle that applies. First, we need to recognize that our position does not change, just as it did not for Israel as the people of God. However, victory over sin, over discouragement, over all the things that would keep us down comes when we choose to walk according to the will of God. It comes as we do those things that are commanded in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, when we present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, when we are not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind. Likewise, if Israel could have those kinds of, of times of dedication and commitment and actually get it right from time to time, they did not have the benefit of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the power that comes from the Holy Spirit within us as we do. So if Israel could have those moments of success, those moments of victory, we all the more should be able to have such, such victory in our lives because we have God's Spirit living within us, motivating us, driving us, and, and empowering us to be able to live for Him. And so we see this example here in, in the history of, uh, of Israel during the life of Samuel that they did walk according to the Lord's will and they experienced victory. Likewise, we can do the same in our Christian life.
And then in 1 Samuel 8, it marks a major shift in the story and in the history of Israel. This is where the Israelites asked to be ruled by a king. And we're going to look at that in much more detail next week, the, the request to be ruled by a king. But there is one thing I wanted to point out here. We will look at that request in more detail and as we study the life of Saul. However, we will consider today, what we'll consider today is the circumstances that prompted the people to request a king. And it is really the only negative thing that is recorded about Samuel. Samuel basically is recorded to have done, uh, walked with the Lord, to have been a, a committed, dedicated servant of God. But this one thing is mentioned about him in a negative way. He too, like Eli, had, had two sons that were placed in the roles as judges. And these two sons took advantage of their position to take bribes and to cheat the people out of justice and their money. Their actions were so bad that it stirred up the people to ask that they could be ruled by a king. Now, this, of course, came with its own set of problems, and we'll look at that next week. However, the story of Samuel's two corrupt sons brings out a theme that actually runs all throughout First and Second Samuel, that men of God who had children, men of God who had, who had served the Lord, had children who did evil things. This was true of Eli, Samuel, and as we will see uh, in the study later, of David as well. In fact, the one person who seems to have raised the best child in this whole lot was, uh, was the one who was portrayed in the most negative light, and that is Saul, who had a son, Jonathan, who seems to have been a, uh, a, a good guy, so to speak, who, was, who was, did what he was supposed to do. But all the others, these men of God, Eli, and Eli, while there's not a great deal that's said about him, uh, he doesn't seem to be a great servant of the Lord. He seems to have been sincere and committed to do the work of the Lord properly. Uh, and yet he wanted to make sure that his own sons had a comfortable lifestyle, and he set them up as priests over Israel. And he was unable to control them, and their wickedness was renowned throughout the nation. Samuel is described as a very devout and godly person. There is nothing negative said about him other than that he used his authority to ensure that his children had these prominent positions. David, we know, loved the Lord, and while he made some serious bad choices in his life, he most certainly would have wanted his children to walk in the ways of the Lord. So this leads to a topic that hits at the heart of every Christian parent. Everyone wants their children to become God-honoring, honest, hard-working, responsible adults. So what is the key? How can we guarantee that we will successfully raise good Christian kids? And thus, there is a huge industry of books and seminars and conferences with people offering all kinds of Christian parenting advice to try to guarantee that you can raise children that are going, going to embrace the faith and to live by God's standards. I've heard preachers who will essentially guarantee audiences that if they follow that particular preacher's formula for child rearing, their children will certainly grow up to be solid Christians. Now, the Bible certainly places great importance on the training of children. In Deuteronomy, the Israelites are commanded to teach the laws of God to their children. Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Likewise, fathers in the body of Christ are told in Ephesians 6, 4 that they should raise children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Of course, everyone points to Proverbs 22, 6, which says, if you train up a child in the way he should go, when he is old, he will not depart from it. That verse, however, should be understood as a general principle and not as an ironclad promise. The examples of 1 Samuel show that there is no guarantee that a godly parent is going to be able to have godly offspring. We know from scriptural teaching and from real life experience that children who are raised with biblical principles and the example of godly parents are far more likely to become committed Christians themselves. However, it is far from a foregone conclusion, nor is, is it a guarantee that every child raised by Christian parents will grow up to embrace the faith of their parents. Ultimately, each child has a free will and the opportunity to make his or her own choices. Parents can do the best they know how to do 
The church has a responsibility to be there to support parents in the godly nurture of the Lord and to supplement the parents' training with information and resources that will help them to do the job of raising children. Others in the family and the community can also help to guide and direct children as they are being raised. All of those influences are very helpful and useful, but in the end, each person is responsible for the choices which they make. The most important being choices that regard our spiritual destiny and what we do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see here that even Eli, Samuel, and David, godly men, men who sought the will of the Lord, were not able to guarantee the, the fact that their children were going to walk in the ways of the Lord. And likewise, we do know that there are principles, that, the, that are scriptural principles, that, that uh, if followed, we are going to make it much more likely, much, much higher probability. I don't like to use the word probability, but the idea is, statistically, it's more likely that you're going to see children walking in the Lord if they are raised under these principles. But again, there is no guarantee. And this is a theme that we see all throughout First and Second Samuel, of how the children of these uh, these godly men went astray. So we've looked at the life of Samuel very briefly. There's a lot more that was in there. We crammed a lot, eight chapters into this, uh, into these uh, 40 minutes or so of, of message. But what we have learned here is of a man who had a complicated life. And he's not the first one that we're going to see, or the last one. His life was such that he, um, he had to encounter a lot of difficult situations from a very early age, he had a great responsibility. He was called upon to, to um, minister in the tabernacle from the time he was a child. He had to confront his mentor and spiritual guide in many ways, Eli. He had to judge the nation of Israel, and then ultimately his own children went the wrong way, and that caused, in some ways, caused the, the fall of Israel, or, the, or Israel's desire then to, to not be judged by God himself, but by a king. And yet he was a man who was committed to the Lord, a man who was able to do great things for him, for, for God. And I think we can look at Samuel, we can see a lot of things, a lot of lessons that can be applied in our life. Primarily is that lesson of commitment and dedication to the service of the Lord. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank